Strip Mall, the musical. I'm Jason Horton. I'm Rebecca Lieb. And this is Ghost Town. When it seems like the sky's falling down, I will take it to ask. Operations off the ground. Don't give up. You're in luck. I know a place where every man has a dream and every car has a space. Here it calls. It's not a mall. The star studded, high production, surrealistic musical sitcom Shangri La Plaza was originally produced as a pilot for CBS's 1990 91 season. But for one night only, the network decided to air it as a summer fill-in on July 30th, 1990. And that half hour made history. Well, kind of in a really weird and bad way. So we're going to talk about the sitcom Shangri-La Plaza and all of the weirdness that occurs around it. So we're talking about Cop Rock. That was ABC, same year that this came out. It has a very cop rock feel, but what is what are your reactions to this, the intro? I could not tell you what it was about. <laughs> if you paid me any amount of money, uh, it's so abstract, I yeah. guess. And never mind the cheesiness of it. That's, I mean, I expect that. It's 1990, experimental, things are a little bit weird. I was mm-hmm. just saying that, like, good thing, I guess, Seinfeld came and let us say television right, at that point. Yeah. But I, I could not tell. It seemed like a place where maybe there's food <laughs> and maybe you live. I don't know yeah. what it's the hard, deal is. It's hard to, to tell. It's It all began really with 90s L.A. mall culture. Shangri-La was inspired by that. It was filmed on location in a North Hollywood strip mall at the corner of Vineland and Burbank Boulevard in North Hollywood, California. It just went for it. The set, a, a strip mall, was built on top of an original strip mall, which is again where the problems really begin. This mall on mall design was the topic of a Washington Post story in 1990. Emmy award-winning art director Jeremy Railton, best known for his work on Pee-wee's Playhouse, was responsible for the set design. And that's not the only high caliber name attached to this very confused project. Broadway legend Terrence Mann, who played leads in Les Mis and Cats, stars as Ira Bondo, a machine mechanic who works with his brother George. Jeff Yeager, Elaine's musician love interest, John Germain and Seinfeld, speaking of Seinfeld, at the mall's body shop. When Amy, Melora Hardin, yes, Jan on the office, takes over her shitty ex-husband's donut shop, I think after he dies, both brothers are instantly smitten. Future Smallville star and Nexium sex cult leader Allison Mack, a very young Allison Mack, plays Amy's precocious eight-year-old daughter. In her only on-screen acting role, jazz great Carmen Lundy plays the donut shop's only employee. Savon Glover plays a rapping teen commenting on what's happening kind of Greek chorus style. And Oscar nominee Chris Sarandon plays the plaza's landlord. It's, it's, I mean, for something where it's just a pilot, kind of a throwaway, like, experimental pilot, like, pretty heavy-hitting actors. The show itself was helmed by horror sci-fi writer-director Nick Castle. You may know him as the co-writer of John Carpenter's Escape from New York, and he played Michael Myers in the original Halloween. The composers were Craig Safan, or Safan, known from his work on Cheers, and Mark Mueller, who wrote the theme song to DuckTales and Jennifer Page's 1998 hit Crush. It's just like there's a lot of talent involved in this project, and it just gets lost along the way. While working together on projects like The Last Starfighter and Tap, the trio discovered they had a common passion. The three of us loved old musicals. Nick's dad was a choreographer who had done Royal Wedding and many other movies, Safan says. And the opportunity to make a musical finally happened when Castle's pal Jeff Sagansky became the head of CBS. He was looking for something new, some fresh ideas for CBS's programming lineup. Castle, Safan, and Mueller, who dubbed themselves the Schmaltz Kings, were creating an LA-based rock opera and had a unique written and composed by credit on the pilot. They were inspired, like I said, by all the strip malls around them, mall culture in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, kind of creating something colorful, and also their love of musicals. It's like... A hat on a hat on a hat. The pitch to CBS was also pretty weird. 
The Schmaltz Kings cleared off Sagansky's desk, and with a keyboard and two speakers, they performed songs from the show in character. Soon, Shangri-La Plaza's choreography would be Michael Peters, who had won a Tony for Dreamgirls and created the steps for music videos like Thriller and Beat It. The show was all so LA in the 90s, pastels, bright, in-your-face design accents, palm trees, you know, love, death, song. Cocaine. Cocaine, probably. It might have been too realistic, honestly. Quote, I can't tell you how many people pulled into the mall. We had to tell people all the time, it's a set, we don't sell donuts, actor Melora Hardin says. It was pretty self-aware, too, which is surprising from, again, how I viewed it. At one point, Hardin calls the donut shop she inherits uh, postmodern retro American kitsch. It's like a mall sitcom kind of playing itself. So let's take a little break and we'll get back to it. The Shangri-La Plaza shoot was 10 days and everyone who didn't interview about it or talks about it after the fact said it was like so much fun. Everyone got along. It was so great. Everyone was so talented. It was also the most expensive pilot CBS ever made, which probably already damned it for a series pickup. But still, it's bizarre German expressionist highbrow production, completely very cheesy lowbrow sitcom conventions made Shangri-La Plaza very unique, specific and not specific to its time in a way that everyone kind of had fun and got on board with, I, I guess. CBS executives loved the finished pilot, and the crew was told to take some time off before getting ready to start production on the series in the fall, which is also so, let's such like executive speak too, where it's like, great, wonderful, you know, no cracks in this, perfect. Watch your bank account get bigger. Castle, Safan, and Mueller were excited, but not for long. The show was not a hit with test audiences, and when the fall schedule was announced, Shangri-La Plaza was not on it. Quote, I went to Hawaii thinking I was the executive producer of a show on CBS, and when I got there, I received the phone call that we did not get picked up, said Mueller. When the pilot finally aired, reviews were confusing. The Los Angeles Daily News declared it a stunningly bad as it sounds and amusing in its own horrific way. The LA Times didn't even review the pilot, but did publish a, a reader's letter about how much he hated it. It said, On July 31st, I watched the unsold CBS pilot Shangri-La Plaza, a grade-A turkey. I cannot believe the other rejected pilots were worse than this show, a musical set at a mini-mall. It is shows such as Shangri-La Plaza that drive viewers to cable. Ed Smith, Hawthorne, California. And then it went away, disappeared, until 2008 when it was uploaded in its entirety to YouTube. It started getting kind of a cult following after that. While Castle, Safan, and Mueller are proud of their show, they realize that even if it did get picked up, it wouldn't have lasted in the 1990s TV environment. Tens of millions of viewers were expected, and truthfully, ours was a niche show, says Mueller. Niche is really right. The YouTube channels that uploaded Shangri-La Plaza, and there's only a couple of them, have maybe 15,000 hits on them total, which is way less than I thought. But still, it's a pretty memorable pilot for such a low amount of viewers. I think there's something in that. I think absolutely everyone should watch it, especially, you know, if you're relaxing with whatever you like to relax with. Cocaine. <gasps> I was, it's, when I was watching it, it reminded me of what a people in another country <laughs> think like a good American pilot would be. It is like really, really bizarre because I think mm -hmm. the kind of the tone of the, even the singing was a little bit strange. And you, you know, you don't, when you don't recognize most of the people and mm -hmm. in 1990, I didn't know who Melora Hardin was. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, starting in like 2010, sure I did. But back then you didn't know, and I think it was on the strength of executives. And mm -hmm. I don't know what gave people the idea that, oh, well this other, musical sitcom worked why won't this one yeah none of them worked. none of them worked but everyone tried it and none of them worked so it was i don't know what they were maybe it's a thing where it's like no we can do it right yeah or we have all these really talented people it's like you can have as much talent as you want if you don't make it if you don't prepare it and create something together that is as a value in and of itself like why are you wasting all of these people's time when you know they're at mall culture is an interesting and amazing central place, mm -hmm. you know, like a, a TV show, Melrose Place, mm -hmm. which came out two years later, kind of centralized around an apartment complex. Very easy. And, but it's, again, that was very stripped down. Think about how dark things got tone and texture wise. You look at this and it's like Pee Wee's Herman, yeah, Pee -wee Herman's, you know, Big Adventure or Playhouse. And then also any like part adult swim. Yeah. It's like German expression. Exactly. I would see, 
if I saw this on Adult Swim today, I'd be like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, like maybe Funny or Die made this or exactly. Adult Swim or, or Tim and Eric made yeah. this. And, you know, only in, in, I guess, that point in 1990 with those very talented people on the strength of them could make something like this happen. But even when I watched the intro, I was like, I did not know what the show was about. Mm -hmm. I was very confused. I was like, why is more Harden um, made out of sausage links? Yeah, I think those are donuts. Maybe a crawler. Oh, maybe. I don't, I just know that it was just heads of people yeah. and then bodies. And the fact that Allison Mack. Yeah, is Allison in, Mack is like a strange footnote to this. Because there's just so much talk, you know, from the Nexium documentaries yeah. and, and that came out. And, you know, they never mentioned this pilot when they talk about her. They which never mentioned it. They this. just, I don't know, they just gloss right over. But yeah, Shocking. it is super cool. And, you know, this could have been, if you took out the musical element, mm -hmm. a, a show about a strip mall in 1990 sounds perfect. Mm -hmm. I think it's just like, no, we have all these things. Why can't we use it? It's like maybe because it doesn't fit. Yeah, that's like the definition of taste is like pulling back on stuff, even though perhaps you could include it. I guess the cocaine said otherwise. Aww. <laughs>